Indian textiles, 1000 years of art and design. That's the name of an extraordinary exhibition that opens this week at the George Washington University Museum in Washington, D.C. 92 works from the private collections of Karun Thakkar take us from 9th century to 20th century through figurative, floral and abstract textiles selected and curated by Lee Talbot for this exhibition. It's my privilege on behalf of the Voice of Fashion to welcome and host both Lee Talbot and Karun Thakkar to this interview and ask how are textiles different in the visual retelling of history compared to films, documentary, history books and other forms of art. Listen in. How do you define yourself from a collector's point of view? What does a collector really mean? What is the mindset of a collector like? My collecting has always been quite different because I feel quite passionate about most things I collect. And particularly with Indian textiles, I grew up very closely with them. Um, living in Kamlanagar in Delhi and, you know, going to Red Fort markets, trying to find pieces from very early age. So to me, collecting is not just about acquiring objects. It's very much about sharing them, studying them, writing about them working with academics, working with people like Lee, who are curating material in museums. So it's about sharing all that knowledge and excitement that I get from them, and also sharing it with younger audiences as well. Cloth is very different. It's sort of, it's an object. I mean, if we think about our skin, it's the thing we touch every day, you know, we this is the closest thing we have to us and so it leaves traces of us, it leaves a patina and you know often it leaves love, it leaves perfume of the people who have departed and so when you look at old canthas being embroidered using old saris from your mother or grandmother who passed away so you know it's a bit of having that comfort with you so cloth is unique in that sense. How did you possibly select 92 textiles from a repertoire of a thousand years. For a little bit of background, um, the Textile Museum has an excellent core collection of Indian textiles. Um, these are mostly collected by George Hewitt Myers, our museum's founder. He founded the museum in 1925. Um, but until now, um, we've not presented a large scale exhibition of Indian textiles with a catalog since 1982. Um, so we wanted to create an exhibition that would showcase uh, the technical aesthetic virtuosity of Indian textile artisans, um, and also the rich diversity of India's peoples and textile traditions. Um, so in 2018, uh, we assembled a research and curatorial team. Um, and this included Rosemary Krill, um, who'd recently retired as a curator at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, um, Avalon Fotheringham, who's currently a curator at the V&A, uh, and Stephen Cohen, uh, an independent scholar who often collaborates with Rosemary. Um, and up to now, museum exhibitions on Indian textiles in North America and the UK, um, they mostly explored questions of technique, type, region, time period. Um, so the research team thought that a focus on ornament would provide new scholarship on textiles, um, that we could offer a new perspective by looking at the interpretation of these three broad categories of design across time and technique, and also look at the interrelationship between uh, textile design and art, such as painting and architectural decoration. But we realized, you know, of course, the achievements of textile artists, they're extremely wide ranging um, in India, and then no single exhibition can be comprehensive. Um, but we hope that this one will deepen uh, visitors' appreciation of this broad spectrum of creativity that we see in Indian textile parts. All my collecting started with that, because if you look at established museums, especially the textile museum, a lot of the textiles were collected in 30s, 20s. And then if you look at the institutes in London, Victoria and Albert Museum and British Museum, a lot of the collections were made by curators who were traveling to India, um, collecting material they thought was the best. 
So a lot of museums have ended up with the endless Mughal Bhatkas. Amazing, we, I'm not rubbishing them. Their court embroidery is weaving their fantastic works of art. Uh, but they were very high-end works of art. So I mean, when I started, what I was able to do is to look for work done by women, for example. The Bengali Kantas, the Punjabi Bhags, the costume in Northwest Pakistan, borders of Afghanistan which were not really regarded as museum-worthy objects. And the reason for that is they, were, they didn't exist in museums because there were gaps in the museums because when they were collected, the collectors didn't go into people's homes, they didn't know what women were doing, they didn't know the domestic rituals of people, they just went to bazaars and markets. Well, certainly I think um, uh, people in the West, although maybe not completely familiar with Indian culture, um, are aware of the richness of the culture and its ancient history. And uh, textiles are an easy entryway for this. Um, textiles, you know, are a basic human necessity. They're a common denominator across, across time and cultures. Um, and so it's a way for people to understand how people lived, um, what their lives were like, how they created, what they thought was beautiful and meaningful in their lives. There's a very poignant cantha in the catalogue of the murder of Ilokshi, a 16-year-old girl, who it was rumoured she had an affair with. And so her husband, who was a British worker, uh, he was Bengali, but he worked in a British firm as a printer, he killed her. In fact, he decapitated her head. So now it was a very popular story. There are Kaligat paintings depicting that. But if we look at what a woman decided to do, embroider a cantha in it. It's not a quick process with a brush stroke. She must have spent months looking at that, stitching and thinking about the plight of that woman. And it's interesting, someone just did a review saying, oh, it's, it's just not following an order, the show. But you know, that's India to me. India doesn't follow an order. And what you do, it's in the chaos of life. People say, oh, how could you live in Delhi? How could you live? I mean, we, we live there, we take our experiences, and, and that's what I expect the viewer to take from those. Where does the therapy lie, this escape lie for the viewer? How does a curator bring that sense of solace closer to the viewer's mind saying, look here and you may find something therapeutic? We hope that the visitors to this exhibition will be able to see a little bit of the life of the people um, and what they put their own uh, their own personalities, but also drawing in from these um, uh, denominators of the culture as well. At the Textile Museum in general, we try to bring up this idea that textiles are historical sources. You know, they're they're a primary historical source material. Um, and so they're taking you directly into the lives and the mindset of these people. Um, and these, this historical source, it's unfiltered. You know, it's unfiltered through uh, interpretation that you would find in a written history or in some sort of film depiction, for instance. Um, and so it's making a very direct, tangible connection. Yeah, just elaborating a bit on what uh, Lee said, I mean, the Indian textile designs, I mean, one of the fragments that we're exhibiting, which is in the museum collection, is a 9th century one, which was uh, found in Egypt. And we know of Romans one loving Indian muslin. So the trade really goes back to the textiles. But then if we look at even just coming to you, your question, for example, in 1700s, the Indian palampur, which is the tree of life, became very popular in the West. And initially they used to send designs from Europe, the East India Company, because we were in British rule, to copy. But then what they found when the Indian designers put their own interpretation, those designs were really popular. So they started saying their little notes, just get the designers to do their own interpretation. So that is a very crucial period for me when I've studied it, because you had influences coming from China, Japan, Turkey, and that all of them are amalgamated in these Indian palampors, which are very, we've got several in the show, which are very desirable still. So, but those were designs done in 1700s by Indian artists. But if you look at the market now, particularly in the West, and also I'm aware of a lot of designs in India too, 
I mean, a lot of this, those designs are still very much there. So those designs, even 300 years old and some much older, thousand year old, as Lee mentioned earlier, uh, they're still being used. And if you pick up any costume catalog from India or look at the Instagram, so those design some famous so-called designers and fashion houses who have big names. But what they're doing, if you study, if you know about design, they're just copying the earlier designs. I mean, particularly block printing in Jaipur, this very famous maker. I don't think they have a single original idea. The only thing they've ever been able to produce is to look at the other design. And what is sad is those designs are not credited. I mean, there's a piece that I have in my collection of tulips and uh, little bugs. It's a beautiful piece. Uh, we think done for the Dutch market in 17th century by Indian uh, craft people. But the panels have only been found in Japan when I traveled there, so not in Holland. So that was produced in India. Someone copied and, and did a dreadful version of it without giving them any provenance. What is it that the viewer uh, to this exhibition must absolutely not miss? Do you have like a favorite piece there? Your favorite? Well, you know, with over 90 pieces, all of them, the very best examples of their particular kind, and it really is hard to choose one. But there's one that's maybe somewhat unassuming that I just, uh, it, I really marvel at it. And it is a fragment of a Kalamkari um, at 18th century, and it's a scene, uh, it's a secular scene. It's not, uh, uh, it's not religious, and it shows a scene from a marketplace. And in that, um, there is a maybe a fortune teller or a conjurer set up. Um, he has his baskets in front of him, uh, like doing some sort of, you know, uh, trick. Uh, and uh, he has uh, next to him an assistant banging a drum to uh, uh, to capture people's attention. And what goes through my mind is that this is a scene that was probably repeated thousands of times all across India for hundreds of years, but it's ephemeral and we have no other visual record of it. But here it is depicted beautifully and in, in, in incredible quality um, on this textile. And so therefore this ephemeral market scene has survived even to the present day. Um, so it's really taking us to a place, a time that just no longer exists, as do many of the textiles in the exhibition. Uh, but that's just one that I find particularly fascinating.